Unleavened Bread Ministries presents From your hands, your feet, your side Unleavened Bread Jesus Bible Studies with David Eels Can quench my thirsting soul Pure as water made me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you Greetings, saints. Many blessings to you. Thank you for joining us today for the Unleavened Bread Bible Study. Father, in the name of Jesus, this is an important message. We pray that you can get this across to your people today, Lord, that they will hurry to be in the bride. Lord, that they will deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow you seeking only your will in their life day by day. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. All right. Yes, this is an important message. And we're calling it Death and Resurrection of the Davids. And it has just as much to do with the bride. So um, pay attention. Vanessa Weeks had this first revelation here. Um on October the 19th, this 2019. And she said, As this dream started, I was hearing an announcement by the U.S. government, like a public service announcement. Well, let me say, to be able to understand the rest of this dream, we must understand who God says is the government of the United States. Revelation two twenty six and twenty seven say, And he that overcometh, and he that keepeth my works unto the end, that's very important, to him will I give authority over the nations. Authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken in shivers, I also, as I also have received of my Father. So, these people, these overcomers, these people that keep the works of the Lord, they are ruling the nations, and they will continue to rule the nations even more. As this revelation is understood, Revelation 5 and 10 says, and made us them to be unto our God a kingdom and priests, and they reign upon the earth. Interesting. During the tribulation, who is going to reign? Is it the nations? Nope. Nope. It's the people of God. Now, you may be confused because people of God are being, uh, you know, killed during the tribulation, but that's according to the will of God, too. We don't hinder the will of God. We, uh, we uh, are vessels of the will of God. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Remember that just before this, uh, it was spoken of the virgin bringing forth the man-child, in a time when a faction was raised up against them to destroy this child, uh, this head of government. And um, that's, that's the time we're in now. Everything we can see around us is proving this. This was spoken to Jesus. Jesus also is coming again in a corporate body, as you know, the body of Christ. And the first people to actually manifest the body of Christ is the first fruits, which is the man child who is passing this on to the bride, etc. Okay, so unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Notice the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
People point out the man-child in the book of Revelation looks a lot like Jesus. But remember what God told John. Come up hither and I'll show you the things that are come to pass hereafter. So it was not Jesus born of the woman because, uh, physically speaking, because that's when you look all the way through the Bible from when Jesus said he was coming again as a baby born to a woman in John 16, you come to Revelation chapter 12. This is a corporate body of Jesus living in a corporate body to do the same works he did the first time with little Israel and now corporate worldwide spiritual Israel. It, all all types and shadows are fulfilled. And this is speaking about the man-child Jesus and spiritually the end-time man-child body of Revelation 12 who is filled with Jesus by word and spirit. And this war between the faction and the legitimate government, both in the church and in the state government, has proven that God's people who are holy and have faith are ruling over the factions for God. He has shown them what the factions are threatening and the saints are casting it down uh, and sending the angels to fight the battles as in Revelation chapter 12. Remember what Jesus said of Judas? Didn't I choose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He chose a man who was of the devil to be among the disciples, to bring him to his cross. And it was that time he told him to go and do it. He commanded him to go and do it. So you see, the Lord was trying to show us something here, that the man-child, too, is going to be fulfilling this. He knows that this is what's going to come in the end of times on a much greater scale. Revelation 12, 7 through 11. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels going forth to war with the dragon, and the dragon warred with his angels, and they, and they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Uh, and remember when Jesus sent forth his disciples, Jesus gave a type and a shadow of this. You know, I saw Satan fallen from heaven. All right. So he was talking about that as to fulfill a type in his day that's going to be fulfilled in our day. Okay. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast down, the old serpent, he that is called the devil and Satan, deceiver of the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. And I heard a great voice in heaven saying, Now is come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. Notice, the authority of Christ was manifested, and you're going to see in a minute, through the saints and through the angels to cast Satan down. And the authority of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accuseth them before our God day and night. Yes, and they have little little uh, Satans out there running around accusing God's servants too. And they, throughout history, have been a faction against um, any man-child body, any bride body. So, And they overcame him, that is the saints. They overcame him, that is Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they loved not their life even unto death. Hmm. So these are necessary qualities to be overcomers. We see that it is uh, the saints, which means the sanctified ones. Sanctified means separated from sin unto God, right? Uh, whose confession and faith uh, in the blood of Jesus and hate of the old life uh, gives them authority over the angels to conquer all enemies. You'll notice that. In that text. Hebrews chapter 2, 5 through 9. For not unto angels 
did he subject the world to come? Now, let me point something out to you. This is a deception right here. The word world is inhabited earth. And this was a subjection that God did back at the beginning. He even gave to Adam authority over the earth. Okay. So, so let's read this, the Greek word meaning inhabited earth. Okay. For not unto angels did he subject the inhabited earth to come, which was, of course, future for when God did that with Adam, right? Whereof we speak. Notice, it isn't the world to come that we've been given authority to reign over, although we will have authority then, even in the millennium. It's not speaking of that. Uh, we have been given authority to reign over the inhabited earth. And it's the inhabited earth now. But one has somewhere testified saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? In other words, why would you give man this authority? Why did he give it to Adam, who was a natural man, right? Why would he give it to Adam? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? and madest him a little lower than the angels, Jesus came to fulfill what Adam failed to do, which is to pass on to his children the authority that he gave to Adam to give to his children. Thou crownest him, that is man, with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou didst put all things in subjection under his feet, which is, of course, what Ephesians says very clearly, under the feet of his body. For in that he subjected all things unto him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. So it's all subject to man, but not carnal man, fallen man. Adam lost it because he was fallen. It's the regenerate man, the born-again man that has this authority. He is the child of Jesus. The childs of Adam all fell. The childs of Jesus found resurrection life through him. It says, but now we see not yet all things subject unto him. Why is that? Because he is not sanctified. That is man. Not all things are subject to him. He's not sanctified. And he's ignorant that God gave to Adam the authority over the earth, which he lost through sin, but was gained back by the, the last Adam uh, for his children. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. He delegated his authority. He said, What you bind on earth is bound in heaven. He delegated his authority. All authority over uh, Satan and all of his gang, he delegated that authority. I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. He delegated that authority. Wow. He put all that authority in man. That's why he says, what, do you, what is man that you're mindful of him? <laughs> yeah. Fallen man really is nothing to be given any power to, you know, except as a vessel of dishonor. Um, but we behold him who hath been made a little lower than the angels, even Jesus, because of suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, and that by the grace of God he should taste of death for every man. And what did Jesus become uh, when he was resurrected? He had authority over all of the creation of God. He was given that. And we've been given the resurrection life of Jesus here on this earth. We are to lose our life in order to gain our life in order that Jesus lives in us by his word and by his spirit. Jesus was our example to reign through death to self, which we're going to speak of more below, okay? Our dreams have shown the David man-child body of reformers 
in the United States to be the real president, without which our physical president would not have come to office or be able to reign. And here's a good example of this. I mean, I, this dream is just saying what the Bible has already said in so many ways, and people are ignorant of it. And even today, if God's people get the revelation of this, there will be a Red Sea. <laughs> and there is coming a Red Sea. And it only takes a few that have the revelation to bring these things about. When one prophet stood up and spoke the word of the Lord, it was sealed. It was going to come to pass. It only took one prophet to do that in the Old Testament. God had to speak it. He had to speak it through men because through men the earth was destroyed and through men the earth is going to be changed. And that's God's decision. He has made that decision. So here's an example of what I'm talking about, about the president. And, of course, those sanctified saints who are under the president, spiritually speaking, they're incorporated into this. So Eve got this on 11 11 uh, 2016. She said, I dreamed that I was standing in the back of a press conference room. There was a stage up front and a podium, and there were reporters seating in the chairs on the floor, waiting for the president elect to come and give his acceptance speech. I could hear people all over the world cheering and celebrating their victory. Righteous people would, of course, done that and did do that. Uh, the, the alternative was horrid and uh, destructive to all of Christianity. And by the grace of God, he revealed to his servants what he wanted to do, and they believed it, and they spoke it into existence. And it's been happening. The term here, president-elect, is used when he is elected to office but not yet inaugurated. And there is a uh, president-elect out there, I call the man-child, who has not yet been uh, anointed or caught up to the throne. But very shortly, that comes immediately after the death of the man-child, is the catching up to the throne of authority. Okay? The man child has authority through the knowledge of the word now, but that anointing breaks every yoke. This man child is going to be able to speak perfectly for the Lord. Not because of man's ability or being able to overcome within himself, nothing like that. This is all going to be by grace. It's God's choosing. Yeah. I was expecting Donald Trump to come walking in, but instead, almost like I was given a glimpse of a parallel universe, David Eels, <laughs> as a type, of course, of the David Manchild Company, came walking in from the right of the stage with four large bodyguards, which are angels, dressed in white shirts and black suits with no ties. Mm-hmm. And David was dressed in an ivory-colored suit with a white shirt. There were about 15 or 20 government agents, again, these are angels, uh, gathered all around the podium. You know, the spiritual government agents are the angels. The agents were waiting for President-elect David to give them their orders. And that was, to, of course, to arrest the criminals in the government and in the church, among other things. All over the stage, among the agents, were many empty cardboard boxes that had been opened up and were ready to be packed up. <laughs> Somebody's packing to leave, right? As David stood on the podium... He began motioning with his index finger to each agent, giving them their orders one at a time. And this is done by the authority given to them by Jesus uh, in the spiritual realm. I understood that he was sending them throughout Washington, D.C. 
to find all the evil, wicked people in the government and to flush them out of their hiding places and send them packing. Amen. We believe it. In the name of Jesus, we command it so. Right, saints? We command it so. Drain the swamp. We've got an angel. We've got to drain the swamp um, sign um, in our house here. And an angel stands there by that sign with his sword, tapping that sign. Drain the swamp. He wants us to get busy and do what we're called to do. We have to speak. Just like all the prophets through the Bible had to speak. We have to speak it into existence. Uh, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Right? She said, I then had a vision of corrupt government officials hiding under their desks in fetal positions. They were terrified and paralyzed with fear and couldn't function anymore. Well, that's as it should be, right? Let us, through the authority given unto us, root out the corruption and send them packing to their Red Sea. And as we commanded it, the angels will do it. But, but remember that the corruption in the government of the church must go too. And that God has chosen Babylon, deep state, to carry this out. He uses vessels of dishonor for dishonorable works. And these people will carry it out. And so, in other words, some people's idea of what's right and wrong is not necessarily right in the kingdom. God uses these wicked people. And he uses them to crucify his people. And uh, every beast that God raised up in the Bible, he raised them up to conquer his people when they were in rebellion. And the prophets prophesied it to come to pass. They didn't try to stop it. Jesus didn't try to stop it. He told them what was coming in 70 A.D. He never one time tried to stop it because he knew it had to happen. So God has authority over vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. And he said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall in any wise hurt you. I give you authority over the power. So remember that it's, it's their power to do evil. Yeah. Paul even used their power to do evil when he turned a man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so his spirit would be saved in the day of the Lord. That's a good use of the devil. He is a vessel of dishonor. He's the head over the vessels of dishonor. God uses him to spank people when they're out of order. He uses beast kingdoms who are the body of Satan to... Uh, Crucify his people when they're out of order with his word, right? And he said, I also think the boxes represent the timing of the wilderness as well as sending the enemy and their evil vessels packing. Yes, I mean, well, a lot is happening before the wilderness tribulation. A lot is happening because what's happening to the man child and the bride here is going to happen to the church after the wilderness begins the tribulation begins that's why we're in training to know how to deal with this situation because the church has the foggiest idea they don't have the foggiest idea of what to deal with this situation and how to handle it and when they have authority and when they don't have authority right you don't have authority to go against god's will you have authority to fulfill his will, including using the beast to crucify the wicked. Amen. And I believe this dream has two meanings, she said. The elect corporate man-child is coming into power in the spiritual realm concurrently with Trump in the physical realm. And also, Father is confirming that the body of David's has power to send forth the angels to expose, and I and I add uh, and and eject <laughs> the evil. 
Uh, he is answering our prayers of faith. Yes, he is. And he's giving us instructions constantly of what to pray, who to come against, who to cast down. Every morning we gather together and ask of the Lord to give us scriptures to, in direction in prayer and in faith and in authority. And he gives it and we pray it and it happens. And it will happen with you too if you're a righteous person. All right. So the angels fulfill what the saints speak in agreement with God. Hebrews 1 and 13 says, But of which of the angels hath he said at any time, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to do service for the sake of them? that shall inherit salvation, they serve those who inherit salvation. They fulfill their words, like we just read in Revelation 12. Notice the Lord rules through his true saints and angels. Psalm 103 and 19 says, The Lord hath established his throne in the heavens. His kingdom ruleth over all. Bless, bless the Lord, ye his angels, that are mighty in strength, that fulfill his word. The angels hear the word of God. Doesn't matter who speaks it. Hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all ye his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So you see very clearly there that the angels will fulfill the word of God that comes out of the mouth of God's people. <clears throat> And they are waiting. They have authority to exercise that when they hear it spoken. Why? Because with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. They wait for it to come out of your mouth because they know that you have the authority to bind and loose. You have authority to bind Satan, or you can bind the angels. Remember, Jesus could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. They weren't speaking belief, and the angels had no authority. Even though they were there, they had no authority. And we have authority to loose, Jesus said. And when we speak, we loose the angels, and we bind the devils. And the angels go forth to do on behalf of Christ to fulfill his work. So, let us exercise our authority over the evil in all branches of this government. We are the salt of the earth. If we lose our savor, we're good for nothing but to be trodden under the foot of men. And that will happen if you don't know you have any authority. If you don't fight, you will lose. It's that simple. Right now, you need to be fighting. The enemy's kicking back. He is uh, about to make a major false flag attack, or I should say false flag attacks, to bring forth major false flag attacks to try to stop going to jail, <laughs> or worse, a firing squad. Um, Luke 10 and 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall in any wise hurt you. Matthew 18 and 18, Verily I say unto you, What things soever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Now, I know people just read that and they don't believe it. They just don't believe it because they don't have the foggiest idea what the Scripture says. They, they've just, they're following their preacher. They're not studying the Word to find out who they are in Christ. And, um, and what things soever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Psalm 149 and 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand, 
to execute vengeance upon the nations. Who is who is exercising authority over the nations? And who's been given all this authority? It is the saints of God. And punishment upon the peoples to bind their kings with chains. Have you been binding any kings with chains? Well, you need to do just that. And you know, you know who the deep state criminal uh, leaders of the governments of the world are. You can tell by what comes out of their mouth and what they believe. That's them. Okay. Bind them with chains. And their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have what? All his saints. Saints meaning sanctified ones. Amen. Now, so I'm not saying that the man child is the only one has got this authority. He's just coming to demonstrate it and to teach it and to impart it to uh, the saints. If you don't have, uh, if you're not a sanctified one, and you're walking in willful disobedience, um, your heart condemns you, you have no faith, you can't do this. It, you can't do it to save your life if it comes to that. And you're no good to your children. You're no good to the people around you. You're no good to anybody unless Jesus is walking in you and you're believing that word. Hear me. This, all of this is coming. A great backlash from these people who don't want to lose all of their money and their lives. They're fighting for their lives. And if you don't know it, I'm telling you, they're marching them down there to Gitmo, and they're taking some of them out, and they're jailing some of them. And they know it. So now we know who God sees as the government on this earth. And we can return to the rest of Vanessa's dream. She said, the people were excited about a coming communication from space <laughs> where we had astronauts, I think, at a space station. Well, <clears throat> those David Manchilds who are in heavenly places in Christ, as the scripture teaches, will soon speak more perfectly by anointing from the Lord. Ephesians 1, 2 through 4 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Yes, when you're in Christ, you do as Christ did, abiding in Him uh, is to be what he was. And, and that is because we're being conformed to the Word of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So so that's what we do. We renew our mind with the Word of God so that Christ himself can live in us and act through us and do his works through us. And these people who are in heavenly places in Christ uh, have this authority and exercise it. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. I'm sad to say there's so many lying preachers out there that don't believe this and won't preach it. You're always going to be a sinner. That's what they say. You have no hope. Just be forgiven. No, that's not what he's saying here. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before him in love. And if you've got that holiness, that which is the same word for sanctification, if you've got that holiness, you are bold in him. And you can exercise his authority because you are the body of Christ in this earth. And those who have ears to hear will hear the word from heaven, just like it in in parable here is coming from these astronauts, right? <laughs> we had an article on our site, but I couldn't find it a while ago. Uh, the Davids will speak from heaven, I believe was the name of it. It's very been up there a long, long time, but I couldn't find it. Uh, 
He that is of God hears the words of God. See, so the, the, the people get faith. The people who are of God get faith when they hear the words of God. They too can step into Jesus and do the works of Jesus, right? Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Did you hear what he said? As the astronauts talk to each other, we would be able to hear them through transistor radios, she said. Isn't that interesting? Um, this means that they will be heard through the airwaves, that they will also be heard through the media and satellites, etc. And I'll throw a couple of links in here so you can see that this is not anything new that we're preaching here. It's been in the Word for a long, long time, and we've been preaching it for a long, long time. And I just grabbed a couple I remembered. Our site is extremely big now, and I, I can't remember everything that's in there or find it. <laughs> but uh, this announcement was uh, telling us, she said, that we'd only be able to hear the men through government-issued earbuds. <laughs> I'll say that again. But this announcement was telling us that we'd only be able to hear the men through government-issued earbuds. Hmm. So the what? now what government are we talking about? The heavenly government. And they're issued from the heavenly government. The heavenly government is able to give you ears to hear. And him that has ears to hear will do so through the word of the government of God, which will be the word of Christ. Romans 10 and 17. So belief cometh of hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. When Christ speaks, faith enters into people. And when Christ speaks through his people, faith enters into people. Matthew 13 and 23. And he that was sown upon the good ground, this is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, who verily beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. See, when we hear the word of God that's sown into our hearts, as this parable speaks, uh, it brings forth fruit. And that fruit, let me tell you, is not the fruit of other souls. It is, that's a byproduct. The, the fruit is the fruit of Christ in you. The sower went forth to sow the seed. In Matthew 13, sometimes that seed, word seed is, is spelled sperma, which is the seed of God. God is coming to life in us. Don't you know that Christ is in you unless you indeed be reprobate? Yes. And, and, and who is Christ? Well, you'd have to read the Bible to find out, wouldn't you? You'd have to know what he is, what he does, what he believes, what he wants us to believe, who we are, who he wants us to believe we are. <laughs> you see, this all comes by the word of God. You don't waste your time going to a church that doesn't have any power and doesn't believe these things. You are not in a church. That is not a church. The church is the called out ones. You are called out of that. Jesus' first disciples, he called the church because they came out of apostate religion, even the religion that God started. He called them out of it because it had become so corrupt and the leaders were so corrupt just as they are today. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Don't touch the unclean thing and I will be to you a father and you shall be to me sons and daughters. Come out. You have to be the church. The church is not the religion. The church is those that come out of it. 1 John 4 and 6, We are of God. He that knoweth God... Heareth us. <laughs> there you go. He that knoweth God heareth us. They have ears to hear. Government issued. <laughs> Even he who is not of God heareth us not. 
See, so they don't get the government-issued earbuds, right? But this we know, the spirit of truth. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Amen. So get your earbuds, your government-issued earbuds, right? <laughs> uh, so you can hear, because there's about to be announcements made. And they're going to come through the man-child just like they came through Jesus, the man-child. They're going to come through Jesus in the man-child in our day. They're going to be spoken. And everybody that hears will be able to bear fruit and quickly. And that's necessary because we're coming to the last eight years. Yeah. And I thought, that's silly. Well, you know, when we first looked at this dream before we realized what God was actually saying, we thought, hmm, that's, that's, <laughs> she thought, that's silly. If this was real, we would be able to hear the conversation without those earbuds. Well, not these earbuds. These are government issue earbuds. They're, they're, they're ability to hear beyond human ability to hear. You know that? I was looking out the window on a clear day while hearing this. The communication was to take place in a few days. Hmm. I believe God's given us this because the communication is going to be in a few days. And the government wanted everyone to get their earbuds or they would miss this historic event. It is a historic event because it is the appearance of the anointed man-child. And according to this, in a few days, it won't be months, it'll be days. You know, not that days won't turn into months, but it'll be days, not a whole bunch of months for certain. I'm, I'm thinking we're either going to see spring in fall or we're going to see spring in spring. But we're going to see spring. It's a spiritual spring. It's a time of life, giving life, right? The anointed man child will appear in a few days to speak the word from heavenly places to those who have heavenly ears, right? Government issued earbuds. As I was looking out the window and up in the sky, it was like I could almost see the space station. Then I was with a group of people and saw a lady in a mod, quote-unquote, dress. And red was the main color. I would say maybe washed in the blood? Yeah. She was take, talking to someone about 1967. Well, mod was a term for fashions during the hippie era in the late 1960s, which originated from England. And let me say, putting on clothing is to put on the very nature and works of Jesus. Romans 13 and 14 says, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So you put on Jesus, which is his works, and not provision for the flesh to do its works. Right? So this mod uh, term here, uh, red, let's, let's go on. Uh, they were very flamboyant, often with random patterns and vivid colors. Well, you know, Joseph, um, he had a coat of many colors. And we learned that it represents the attributes of the light. You know, like a prism breaks down the light into different colors, right? And the light is Christ. So these are the attributes of Christ, the different colors, the attributes of light and tended to break previous rules of dress. Now here, now the rules of dress is like when you go into religion and you start acting and doing things the way they act and do things. That's putting on religion. That's not putting on Christ. 
when you read about Jesus and his acts and his spoken word in the Gospels, you realize that's who he is. That's who we are to put on. He is our example, not religion. Religion just stunts people totally. And um, keeps them from going, entering through the door. He talked about the Pharisees standing in the door, not entering in, wouldn't let anybody else enter in, right? They won't. You must come out from among them and be separate. So they broke previous rules of dress. In other words, they will be nonconformists to the traditions of men and will have uh, a lot of attention, as did Jesus. They were flamboyant. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, right? Oh, how we need you. Then the scene changed, and all of us of UBM were in a garage. There were a lot of people I did not know there. Well, there's a lot of people out there in UBM that I don't know. <laughs> and I did recognize Ty. Barry and I had a new house which they're expecting to get shortly. And it seems this garage was just a few yards away, but it wasn't ours. As I was walking around inside the garage, I saw a white propane tank. Well, that's interesting. We Recently, I don't know, maybe five or six months ago, we had a dream with a white propane tank in it, and the Lord revealed to us what that was. He pointed out that the propane tank was the power of the Holy Spirit to sacrifice the flesh by fiery trials. The propane tank was hooked to a barbecue pit, and a lot of flesh was being put on there and being crucified. So the, pro, the white propane tank represents the power of the Holy Spirit. And um, the Spirit of God who crucified Jesus at the hands of the wicked uh, is symbolized here. Isaiah 53 and 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, Smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God. Remember that God used the people of Israel, Herod, Pontius Pilate, you know, all of the wicked vessels to crucify Jesus, according to the book of Acts, right? So he was smitten of God. God sacrificed his own son for us and afflicted. So remember that. This propane tank is to put to death the people of God to enable them to have the crucified life so that they can have the resurrected life of Jesus. That's what this propane tank is for. Watch. I walked around it to the right and I saw some people I didn't know. They were dark-skinned and we're sad, upset about something. Dark skinned use, usually means walking in darkness, right? And when I read this, this is what I believe the Lord spoke to me, Zechariah 12 and 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look unto me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. They got the revelation that they killed Jesus, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Okay, who is God's firstborn? <laughs> well, David, who represented Jesus, and Jesus in the end time, David's, in Psalm 89, was called his firstborn. These were firstborns. David, Jesus, 
and the end time man child are first borns. Uh, because they're the father of a next generation of people. Remember, the Apostle Paul called himself a father. He said, you have not many fathers. I begat you through the gospel. And he, even to this day, is bearing fruit, you know, uh, of the word of God that he spoke. All right? He's a father. Abraham was a father. The Davids are Abrahams. They are bringing forth a new generation. Remember, Jesus was the last Adam to bring forth a new generation, not like the, the generation that Adam, the first Adam, brought forth. They were unregenerate. Jesus brought forth the fulfillment of the fleshly Adam's generation. The born again generation of Jesus Christ is what is this is all about, right? So the dark people are the faction who pierced the hands and the feet of David, Jesus, the man child. And hands represent works and feet represents the walk. They, they pierced his hands and his feet. They, um, crucified his hands and his feet, which the faction falsely called sin, just as they did with Jesus. In other words, Jesus and the man, child Davids, are falsely accused of their works, their hands, their feet, and their walk. Right? Falsely accused. And they're doing their job. They're doing what has to be done, but they don't get a reward for doing that. There will be a remnant come out from among them to go and tell the world what happened. They will be like Paul's. Remember, Paul crucified God's children too. And he was delivered for God's purpose of showing one who had been totally against the Christians and crucifying the Christians um, to turn and tell the truth of what he had done and who they were. God wanted that. And he's going to have it in this day too. There's going to be some Pauls come out of the faction. Yes. In Jesus' name. I wanted to ask them what was wrong. Just then I looked down and saw the shoes of a man that was lying on the ground. <laughs> they had smitten him. <laughs> then I saw that it was David lying there as a, as a type, of course, of the David man-child body, right? They crucified Jesus. He would be laying there. And uh, they crucified uh, the Davids in our day. And that's almost over because the Davids are about to resurrect. Oh, my goodness. When that happens... The world is going to be shaken because Jesus lives in them. You know, Jesus is the Word. If the Word lives in you, to that extent, Jesus lives in you. That's right. It's not just the Word in your mind. It's the Word in your life, right? So David was laying there. So these people fled because of what they realized what they had done, right? And I had a vision of him hitting his forehead on the white propane tank and falling down. Isn't that cool? Yep, smitten of God through the faction, as it was with Jesus, Joseph, Jeremiah, the man childs of of history, right? And, of course, the man-child of our day. It made it a large dent in his head. <laughs> he was lying there, and I was standing to his right. And he took hold of my left hand with his right hand. He did not say anything. Barry put a, a white pillow under his head. And as I was typing this, I, I, it reminded me of Jacob as he slept with a stone under his head. Genesis 28, 11, and 12. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. 
And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. And as you know, during that time, he was persecuted by Esau, you know, who represents these people here, too. You know, they they helped to make David, the Esau's did. They crucified, uh, excuse me, Jacob. They crucified Jacob, right? Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Well, I've, I've said it. Uh, Lord, give us the gift of death. You know, Jesus gave us the gift of death, not just the gift of resurrection. He gave us the gift of death. We reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. We consider it done. It's a gift of God. And we should be thanking Him for this and asking for this and walking the crucified life, which is denying yourself, which is death to self, and uh, receiving His life, which is resurrection life, right? You can't be His disciple unless you walk the crucified life. He said so. Well, most of those people scattered. And this reminds me of this scripture, Mark 14 and 27. And Jesus said unto them, All ye shall be offended, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered abroad. Well, that's exactly as happened with us, as an example. She said, I, I wanted to yell, Call 911, <laughs> but, but I couldn't speak. Uh, God didn't permit it, right? We don't need any of that help. This is a good thing. This is God's plan. At first, David was bleeding. But then I realized that he was no longer bleeding and was amazed. What, is, what does blood represent? Uh, Leviticus 17.11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. In other words, the Davids were being emptied of the life of the flesh so that the life of Christ could fill them by spiritual resurrection, right? And that's told us in 2 Corinthians 4, 10 through 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, so that the life also of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. They lied to us. They said we couldn't get this till we went to heaven. The life of Jesus is to be manifested in our mortal flesh. That's our human flesh. And again, he teaches us this same lesson in 16 through 18. Wherefore, we faint not, but though our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. So the carnal man, the flesh man is dying, but the inner man is coming to life. And, and, it, and it has to happen day by day, folks, or when you get to the end of the race, you've got nothing in your hand, you see. Um, for our light affliction, which is for the moment, worketh for us more and more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. So this resurrection life of Jesus is his glory. And we behold in a mirror the glory of the Lord and are transformed into his same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord the Spirit. It's from the Lord. It's a gift from the Lord. We behold in the mirror Jesus, and we know that that's our gift. He made reconciliation. He exchanged the life of Christ for our life, and now we are to believe we have his life and not our life. And this is a process of getting rid of that old blood and getting that new blood, that blood that's not contaminated, right? 
getting rid of that old blood we got from our parents, that nature that we received through the blood from our parents, the Adamic nature. And now we're in this process of getting rid of the old blood and getting the new blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, the inheritance of God, <clears throat> not the inheritance of man. While we look, let's see what brings this to pass, this eternal weight of glory, this manifestation of Jesus in you. It says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. What are the things that are not seen? What the Bible says about us. Who we are. Sons of God. A new creation. Old things passed away. All things become new. Those are words of faith. That's calling the things that be not as though they were. Were. When, did, when were you perfected? At the cross. When were you healed? At the cross. All of this is already done. It's all past tense. Go and look. Or read our book, um, The Real Good News. Read that book. You'll find out it's already done. It is the real good news. Most Christians have never heard the gospel. Read that book. You'll see what I'm talking about. So we don't look at the things which are seen, which you see your natural face in the mirror. If you see your natural face in the mirror, you're going to go away and forget what manner of person you were. A hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, as James put it. You won't be able to obey because there's no faith involved. You have to see Jesus in the mirror. You don't live anymore, like Paul said. You don't live anymore. It's Christ that lives in you, right? The life that you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God, which calls the things that be not as though they were, were. It happened at the cross. You were perfected there. Claim your perfection. Right. But at the things which are not seen. So the Bible says things that you look and you say, hmm, that don't fit me very good. Well, it's faith. That's why. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Temporal is earthly and temporary, uh, but the heavenly is uh, what we've been given in Christ, right? Oh, thank you, Father. So Vanessa said, I was afraid he was dying. <laughs> thank God. And I wanted to say, I love you, but I could not speak. And when I saw him run into the tank and fall in the vision, I remembered that I had already dreamed this. It was very real, and I was afraid that he was dying. Well, she didn't really understand this thing until we got the key, you know, and I didn't understand it. I just read very quickly through it. I said, that don't sound good. <laughs> but then I went back and started meditating, and as I did, the Lord started sharing with me the real meaning of this thing. Many, many times the Lord gives us things that, are, that uh, look contrary in the letter, but are great in the spirit, right? Dying, uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, right? Dying is not a bad thing. Heaven ain't bad, as you've heard me say. Heaven ain't bad. Some people cry about people going to heaven. Well, that's because that's you. You know, that's because you're going to miss them. Okay. But just remember, they're very happy where they're going. <laughs> and And they really wouldn't want to come back. <laughs> in most cases, sometimes God sends them back for a purpose and he has somebody resurrect them. He does that too. But sometimes they don't want to come back and they're, they're, they're clawing the floor. <laughs> no, 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 don't send me back to that place. <laughs> uh, well, notice uh, that God through his spirit smote the shepherd. But he did it through Judas. And that's the verse that Vanessa received by faith at random. She said, I asked the Lord for a word about this dream and received by faith at random, Second Thessalonians 2 and 8, in context 7 through 9. For the mystery of lawlessness does already work. Only there is one that restraineth now, 
until he be taken out of the way, or literally come out of the midst. And then shall be revealed the lawless one. So uh, what restrains, of course, the Bible says, is uh, the lawless one in the midst of the body. It's unholy because he's in the midst of the body. We've just gone through a pretty trying period since 2011 of factions of people who were in our midst and we were getting along with suddenly because of a hidden sin or uh, unforgiveness or criticism in their heart against someone else were suddenly taken out by this temporary, if not eternal, reprobation of faction coming over them them not understanding who they were or what they were or believing in us anymore. They were suddenly our enemy because a demon was in their heart, right? And this separated them from us. It sanctified the body. So this lawless one has to come out of the midst. And uh, it says, Whom the Lord Jesus shall slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to naught by the manifestation of his coming. Where is he coming? He's coming in his people. How can he come in his people if Judas is in the midst? There's an unsanctified body there. So God is getting rid of the Judases. He removes them. And all he's got to do is turn you over to the devil and you're gone. We watched it happen over and over. And then they go out to slander and lie and crucify us and so on and so forth. But it's all for God's purpose and they don't know it. They just enjoy doing it while that demon's in them, right? Whose coming is according to the working of Satan. Yes, that's exactly what's happened with them. With all power and signs and lying wonders. So the son of perdition, whom Jesus said was Judas. And there are many Judases today. And that's what the prophecy in Second Thessalonians is all about. Um, you know, um, uh, a body of Judases. So, uh, which is the faction who betrayed and slayed the son of David. You know, we can see here in this parable, Matthew 25 and 40 says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you did it unto one of these my brethren, even these least, you did it unto me. Anybody that you crucify that belongs to Jesus, you are crucifying Jesus. That's the facts. We are the body of Christ. And if you do something to one of his, you're doing it to him. He said so. And uh, even much more the man-child, because a man-child is, is, I would say, very mature in the Lord and about to be anointed. Um, and so that's, I mean, the more you get like Jesus and you know it, all you've got to do is just examine your past. The more you get like Jesus, the more enemies you got. Because Jesus is contrary to this world. He's a nonconformist. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, he is. And that's what makes them so angry. It's kind of like, uh, you know, this the left wing and the right wing and Trump. Well, Trump is, is doing, I believe, what God has ordained him to do. I'm not saying he's a Christian. I'm just saying he's or, been ordained of God to do these good things. And they are good for the, for the co country. And they hate him so much. And they haven't done their job since they've been in there. They hate him so much. They want to get rid of him. And they can't do their job. They all ought to be fired, obviously. They're trying to get rid of him, but they need to be gotten rid of. So thank you, Lord, that you're doing that. Your angels are going forth to route them out and bring those stinkers out and bring them down to the Red Sea and dunk them. <laughs> I also received uh, this scripture by faith at random, Jonah 1, 13 through 17. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get them back to the land, but they could not. For the, the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Uh, wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life. That was Jonah who was running from the Lord, right? 
and lay not upon us uh, innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. Oh, yeah, they knew he was God, didn't they? And they offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. And the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And of course, she says, of course, this reminded me of Matthew 12 and 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There it is, the death of Jesus, the death of the man-child, three days and three nights before what? Resurrection. And look out, devil. Right? In this dream, this text uh, speaks of the death, burial, and resurrection of the son of David. Right? Who has another meaning in our day. The death to self of the David man childs is necessary for the life of Jesus to come in them to lead us through this coming wilderness. Okay. She said, the morning after this dream, we received two words on the resurrection of the son of David. Sue Gilbert received Matthew 28 and 8. In context 6 through 8, he is not here, for he is risen. <laughs> Even as he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead. And lo, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And Shea received uh, Acts 2 and 30, in context 30 and 31, being therefore a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath unto him that the fruit of his loins would be, he would set one upon his throne, he foreseeing this spake of the resurrection of the Christ, that neither was he left unto Hades, uh, nor did nor did him flesh seek, did his flesh see corruption. Let me change that letter. There. Praise God. So we see here that that too is going to be manifested again. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, that he was coming again as a man child born to a woman. Yeah. The only place you can find that is Revelation 12. It's happening in our day. Corporate body. Remember, when Jesus stepped into the New Testament, he became a corporate body. The body of Christ. What about the body of Antichrist? Well, it's here too, as we're told plainly. There is Christ and there is Antichrist. Two men in the earth. And just as Jesus ministered to little Israel, so he manifested in the, or manifests in the man child in our day to minister to worldwide spiritual Israel. Who is an Israelite in our day? One who's circumcised in flesh or in heart? In heart. That's the Christians. The real Christians. So we see from these two verses um, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead after three days and um, and the catching up to the throne of the man-child set one upon his throne and Jesus said he and that overcometh he will sit down with me in my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father in his throne so Jesus was saying a man-child was coming hmm and, that, and not that he's the man child's the only one to come to that position. That's not true. Um, he's the first fruits, as we said. His job is to bring the rest of the body, the bride first, into that position. Right.
And so she prays, Father, we pray and believe that no weapon formed against the Davids will prosper. We bind Satan from destroying God's plan for his sons. Yep, well, we know that Satan is a part of God's plan to slay the Davids. 1 Corinthians 2 and 8, which none of the rulers of this world hath known. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, the rulers of this world, by the way, are first of all the demonic hordes of Satan. Second of all, the evil rulers that we know so much about these days. <laughs> these people. If they had known what they were doing, they wanted to get rid of Jesus, but they were really uh, making him invincible <laughs> with all power and authority. You know, praise God. Same thing today. So the demons and their hosts they have a job to crucify Jesus wherever they see him. <laughs> and uh, she said, Thank you that the Lord Jesus will bring to nothing the lawless one by the manifestation of his coming. This is true. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so now we're going to go to Debbie Fenske's prophecy and revelation. She called Empty Me. And, uh, you know, she hadn't really had the foundation of this dream that we just had when she received this, if you just want to know. Uh, Debbie Fenske, this, she got this on the 24th of this month of October, 2019. She said, yesterday morning, Wednesday morning, October 23rd, I was, uh, oh, okay, it's 23rd, I was awakened at 4.13 a.m., by a loud voice. I had fallen asleep on our sofa, and Denny was in the bedroom, and my first thought was that he was yelling to me to get up, but when I looked at the clock, I saw that it was too early to be getting up to get ready for the morning prayer meeting, which we have every morning, right, or almost every morning. Um... My mind cleared enough to realize that it was not Denny's voice. It was the voice of God or the voice of an angel of the Lord. And what he spoke was not in words I recognized. There are tongues of men and tongues of angels, are there not? Yes. And it was really loud. It sounded to me like two words were spoken. I asked Father to let me know what he was saying through these words, and I immediately heard, empty, E-M-P-T-Y, quote, unquote. And he continued speaking. He said, this is the word for you, my people, empty. The time is now to be empty. I am still uncovering hearts, and will you spend time with me? For your hearts, your very life, is the temple in which I dwell. See, if you're not empty, you can't dwell, right? Do you know that you represent my authority? Well, we just found that out, didn't we? And uh, Debbie didn't know you know what this dream was all about. Did you know that you represent my authority? Do you truly know? Know this, that I know your name, and you hold my name. You know, we take on his name at baptism, don't we? And it's his, the word name, onoma, means nature, character, and authority. We have the authority of Jesus. We take on his name, his nature, his character, and his authority. Hmm. Would that all of our religious brethren out there knew that. that. That's why we take his name at baptism, right? Actually, it says we're baptized into the name. See, when you're baptized, you 
The old man is put to death, right? But you all also receive the name of the Lord Jesus. You receive him by faith. It's no more I that live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave himself for me. He, he made an exchange. He made reconciliation, which means an exchange. He made an exchange of his life for your life. Now you are a walking, talking Jesus by faith. Right? Yes. Receive it by faith. I'm going, he says, he goes on to say, I'm going to bring back much truth to remembrance and reveal spiritual to spiritual. Remember what the disciples said, that this happened after Jesus died and was resurrected. His words came back to them and they understood it. Yeah. Same thing's going to happen this time. That's what he's saying. Same thing. You are my spiritual people. That's right. Uh, some people think the Jews are God's people. They're his chosen. Well, no. They were his chosen in the Old Testament. If they didn't enter into the New Testament, they're not chosen. I'm sorry. See, the chosen is the ones that bear the fruit of Jesus. He spoke the word to go into hearts to bring forth fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And the overwhelming majority of the Jews did not receive him at that time, and they don't receive him at this time. But, the people who do receive him bear the fruit of Jesus. Not the fruit of their religion. The fruit of Jesus. You are my spiritual people and I want to continue working a spiritual work and a deep work in you and among you. And my authority will be upon you as you allow the spiritual light and truth to pour forth into your heart and your mouth will speak deep things of my spirit, things I have taught you. And people will know these things are true. But my people, there is still some emptying out that needs to take place. For yea, I am cleansing you up. I am cleaning you up, excuse me, cleaning you up. I am making you clean. Only be empty. Empty your hearts and yourselves of all your belongings, longings, uh, trifles, yes, even your own nothingness. What you think of yourself is not important. Glory only in that you are in me and that I am everything in you. That's right. He is everything we want to be and need to be. He is in us already. And that's what you have to claim. Reckon yourself to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. In other words, consider it done. That's how faith works, right? I have a job to do through you. I have chosen you to be my humble and my emptied out and cleaned up vessels. If, you, if you're not empty, he can't fill it, right? But I am letting you know the time is short and I still need room for total residence. You see that? I still need room for total residence. If your heart is filled with the things of the world and what you want to do today and what you want to do, what you was thinking about yesterday that you want to do today, and all these things that you want to do to enjoy life and so on and so forth. Where is there time for Jesus? Where is there time for asking him, Lord, what do you want me to do today? What have you called me to do for you? Right? If you're not empty, he can't fill you. As we just read, the outer man's decaying as the inner man is being renewed. One, one person's got to die. Two people can't live there anymore, <laughs> right? One person's got to die. The other's got to take his place. Okay. I was moved by what Father said, and I was intrigued and wanted to know 
how empty was pronounced in the Hebrew. And I wondered if it was two words, like she heard, right? So I tried something, and I looked things up, and I asked God to lead me. In Hebrew, empty is tohu bohu. That was about the length of the words that I heard so loudly spoken. Some empty definitions are decant, lay bare, empty, raise, spill. Strong Hebrew 7386 adjective, rake, empty, vain. Much that we give ourselves to is nothing, only vanity. Strong's Hebrew 8414, formless, confusion, unreality, emptiness, desolation, empty space. See, so we got a choice. We can be human or we can be sons of God. If you're a son of God, that is God who lives in you, right? It said, properly spelled, it is Tohu Bohu. It's spelled T O H U W B O H U W. And somewhere in all of this belongs Tohu Wa Bohu. And this meaning, Hebrew, wasteness, that that which is laid waste, desert, emptiness, vanity. But Tohu Bohu is parallel to Isaiah 34.11, confusion, emptiness. Speaking about God's wrath against the nations, which he went to be, he, he wants to be no part of. Which we want to be no part of, excuse me. So God is still telling us to get things of Egypt out of us. Isaiah 34 and 11. But pelican and hedgehog will possess it, and owl and raven will dwell in it, and he will stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. There it is, emptiness. In other words, there's no God there, right? Father, may we desire to to become completely empty of ourselves and our personal correctness and I might say our personal interests. All that is vain so that your plumb line finds us measuring up to the fullness of your likeliness, your likeness, excuse me, in us so that we do not fall behind and even become as one of the nations. God, we need you to help us to give it all up. Thank you for your grace to do what you are being so long suffering and telling us to do. Lord, we just ask you to do it in us, right? Do it in us. She said, we do want you fully and totally residing in us. Lord, in Jesus' name, help us to keep the end in view. Amen. That's how faith works. We reckon it done. He was the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. Did he take away your sins? Or do you still believe you have them? That's seeing your natural face in the mirror. Seeing Jesus in the mirror is is akin to believing that he took away your sins. In fact, in the same chapter of Romans 6, he said he made you free from sin. He's not talking about the action of sin. He's talking about the nature of sin. Remember, the action of sin comes from the nature of sin. He has delivered you from the sin nature. He gave you the nature of Jesus Christ. You took on his name at baptism, which is nature, character, and authority. 
if you've delivered of the nature of sin, you're delivered from the sin. God doesn't just want to wash you up on the outside and make you look good to everybody. He wants to wash you up on the inside. He wants to deal with the sin nature itself. That's the difference between the New Testament and the Old Testament. It dealt mostly with what a man did. In the New Testament, he deals mostly with what a man is. If you are like Jesus because you have humbled yourself to the word and your old nature is being crucified because you deny it, it's right to live through you, then you are coming into his image. He will honor that faith. You will come into his image and you will do his works. And Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go unto the Father. Yes, we want the greater works, don't we? And uh, she wrote this text here, Ephesians four twelve through 13. Until we all attain unto the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, if you don't know what a mature man is, he just told you, right? Jesus said 30, 60, and 100 fold. The seed was the seed of the Lord. And that seed in the hearts brought 30, 60, and 100 fold. Every servant, when he is perfected, shall be as his master. Jesus said that. He will be as his master. Why? Because Christ will be living in that person. Where? Where? In his mortal flesh, <laughs> they lied. In his mortal flesh, you don't change on your way through the sky. You change here. Here is where the fruit is born. The fruit is on the plant. The plant is in the dirt. When the fruit comes to fullness and ripeness, it gets picked. Where is it picked from? The earth. You see, people want to stay sinners. They don't want you touching their sin. They want to keep their sin and have Jesus too. And you just can't have them both. And his word is so plain on this, but they won't read his word. They're afraid to read his word because they get confused when they pick up his word. It's so contrary to what they've been learning. But if they would pick up the word and love the truth... They would depart from Babylon and begin this change into the image of Jesus Christ. It has to be done. We need to come into His image 30, 60, or 100 fold. And that is the Word of God in our heart. It's changing us. It has nothing to do with saving souls. Remember, the the seed is in the fruit. If you bear the fruit, you've got the seed. And the seed can reproduce the fruit in other people. You see, other ground. You take that seed and you put it in another ground and it bears fruit. So if you've got the seed, you can bring forth people. Otherwise, you're going to bring forth people in your own image. You might make Baptists. You might make Methodists. You might make Charismatics. You might make, you know, um, Pentecostals. You might make uh, with your seed. But our seed shouldn't be ours. We, we only can sow the seed of God. Paul said, I begat you through the gospel. You have not many fathers, but I begat you through the gospel. It is God's seed that Paul sowed, not his own. Religions sow their own seed. The truth is, the, the true seed of the Lord is the word of God. It's the only thing that can bring forth Christ. The others, they can bring forth after their religion. But only the seed of the word can bring forth Christ. And it bears fruit on the earth. This is where the plant is planted. In the dirt. 
the dirt is necessary to put to death the seed so that it can bear fruit. The dirt is everything that you see around you here. All the corruption. Do you want to grow up out of it? Well, it will put you to death. That's why we're here. We're here to lose our life so that we may gain our life. The seed falls into the earth and dies, or else it abides alone, Jesus said. We came here to die. And people don't want to die. They like the world. But if you don't lose your life, you will not gain your life. Let's just believe the truth here. It's not stepping over a line and accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. Jesus said, if you don't lose your life, you will not gain your life. He was speaking to his disciples. So don't say unconditional eternal security. There's conditions all through the Bible. And he says here, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. First Thessalonians 5 and 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Amen. And, uh, you know, Debbie uh, posted this on our local blog here, and Anna sent this in. She said, this song has been stuck in my head for over a month, and it has been my prayer to be emptied. Uh, and I thought it goes well with this latest word from the Lord. So there's a link here to that song. And it's this is uh, Chris Sly. I'm not sure. Um, but she says you can also go to YouTube. It's called Empty Me <laughs> by Chris Sly. And uh, in uh, the, acoustic, uh, the acoustic version is on YouTube. This one is with a piano. Um, uh, recently I asked the Lord if the reason that the reward is not yet here because we are not yet completely dead and the Lord gave me a yes that's interesting so w when we ask why things are not happening the way we know that they will. The reason is we haven't come to fruition yet. We haven't come to death in order to have fruit, in order to have the reward. God is coming with the reward. He said judgments before him, but his reward is with him. He is going to reward the bride. And the bride is about to be manifested. You remember when the king of kings chose Esther. He had Esther's feast and he gave the rewards. Interesting. Okay. So, Debbie's prophecy about emptying ourselves from all distractions so that we could be filled with Father's will and wishes is basically saying the same thing. I hope you can read this again. This is not something you can absorb over just listening to it one time, but I hope you'll... We're, we put it up in text for a reason so that people can slow it down, meditate on it, let the Holy Spirit speak to them, bring in verses... Uh, all these things. And also, so people who do a search on the Internet will come up with the text. You can't obviously come up with the text if you've got just an audio. So the Lord taught us to do this, and we've been doing it. Some people don't like all the parables. Can't help it. The Lord has given us parables after parables after parables, and he wants us to give them to you. And he's, he's uh, giving understanding to the babes, and hiding it from the wise and prudent, just as he said before. Same thing. You know, in Vanessa's dream, I, as a type, 
of the Davids was dying. I was bleeding. And then the blood quit. Ran out of blood. <laughs> and this represents that all the old life inheritance was about to be gone. In other words, death to self. Right? So, we need to concentrate on this. Whatever is in you that's contrary to God, you can deal with it. And God's giving special grace right now to help you to mature in this race for the position of the bride. The bride is being chosen, and we have but a short time for inspection. Call upon the Lord. This is not something we can do on our own. We can do nothing without Him. If Jesus could do nothing without the Father, we certainly can do nothing without Him. And, and He said that. So call upon the Lord to give you grace for what you need to be. You know what you aren't. You've read the Word. You've heard the Word. You know what you aren't. And you know what you are. And you know what needs to be changed. And go to God. And ask for this special grace he's giving at this time. And keep in mind faith that we don't live anymore, but Jesus lives in us. That's how faith works. You call the things that be not as though they were, right? Jesus said, <clears throat> all things whatsoever you pray and ask for. Now, I hope you're praying and asking for the most important things, which is your life in Christ, right? Anything that you can see is contrary. You ask Him for it. He said, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received, it says in the Greek very clearly, Mark eleven twenty four. Believe you received. Uh, actually, I have the received text, and the received text has a note that it is past tense. Yeah, so the King James is supposed to say the same thing. Believe you received them, and you shall have them. That's the secret of how faith works. Believe you received them, and you shall have it, right? So ask God. Ask Him for the grace that you need. Now, by grace have you been saved through, have you been saved? That's what it says, by faith. By grace have you been saved, by faith. Uh, so, you receive this by faith. And that's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. Ask God for the gift. Ask God for the gift of faith so that you may have grace. Ask him for it. He said, all things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them, and you shall have them. So, so then you just start thanking him for this, right? So keep in mind faith, because <clears throat> when you start introspecting, uh, in other words, looking at yourself, you can get drugged down pretty quickly. But when you see what you are, and what you need, you go to God, and then you enter into the rest through faith, believing that you have received. Because Jesus said, everything you pray for, believe you received it, and you shall have it. So he wants you to walk by faith, not condemnation. Condemnation is <clears throat> looking at what you are and moaning because you don't believe God took that from you. <laughs> That's right. That's what it is. So there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, right? Because you know he took that from you. He nailed it on the cross, and he gave you his life. So see Jesus in the mirror by faith, according to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. Amen. We behold, we all with an unveiled face. That means we're not veiled the way the people were under the law. They saw the letter and their mind was veiled. He said it there very clearly. Uh, we're not under the law. We're under grace. And we 
Behold with an unveiled face the glory of the Lord. And we're transformed into that same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord the Spirit. Look how simple he has made it. I'm a pretty simple person. I need it simple. <laughs> I, I want to remember it, you know. Look and see Jesus in the mirror. That's your imagination. It's your renewed imagination. It's a, an imagination that is of faith. Now, you can have a lot of imaginations that aren't of faith, but that's one that's of faith when you look in the mirror and see Jesus. That's not arrogance. That's trusting His Word. He's told you to do it, Second Corinthians 3 and 18. So you accept that you are everything that you've prayed for. Jesus said, believe you received it. Everything you pray for, believe you received it. This is how the kingdom works. This is how walking in the Spirit is. This is what walking in the Spirit is. You're not walking in what you see in the world. You're walking in what you see in heavenly places in Christ. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. <laughs> and most important, of course, the things we want to pray for is the spiritual things of the life of Christ. Because if you got that, you got everything. <laughs> and reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. Romans chapter 6. In other words, consider it done. Consider it done. He's the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world, although most of them don't believe it and won't receive it. It's still done. And uh, when we do this, we are justified by faith. When we reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto God, we are justified or accounted righteous by faith. Because God gives grace for our faith. Amen. So remember that. And since you are to believe you received everything you asked for, start praising God and worshiping God for the answer. And if you feel like it, go find a brother or sister who has faith and uh, you can tell them to cast those demons out of you. And they can do that. But then you believe you have received So give praise and worship to God for the answer. Amen? Lord, we, we pray and we ask for everyone out there who is in the race for the position of the bride, like in Esther. All the fair virgins of the kingdom were uh, in the race to be the bride of the King of Kings. And only one received the prize, but she was pleasing to the King's helpers, right? Uh, he, they pleased the Holy Spirit. If every day we please the Holy Spirit, we're getting ready to be in the bride. We're running the race. If we please self, uh, no, we've kind of got it on hold. You know, we. He's, Jesus said, unless we take up our cross and follow him, we can't be his disciple. Taking up our cross is to die on, is to die to self. It's that self will not rule your body. Self will not plan out your life. Self will not tell you what you're going to do this morning, what you're going to do today, distract you from your work in Christ your love for Christ, your seeking after Christ. Self is there. You don't believe it? Go sit down and read your Bible. See if he won't try to knock on your door and tell you, oh, don't you remember this or that? You need to get this done. Da -da -da. Yeah. One distraction after another, right? Yep, that's when flesh is alive, right? But you deny it. It's right. You follow the Lord. You do what he wants you to do. And right now, I'm saying what the Lord has told me to say, and that is that He's giving special grace right now to deliver people. 
So things you may have not overcome in the past, you will do it now. And you can study. We have much studying, much on our site, website that helps people to realize and to desire after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, right? How Shall We Die is a pretty good book. It's not talking about physical death. It's talking about death to self. How Shall We Die? And it helps people to keep in mind what they're here for. We came here to die. Some people say that Jesus came to die. He did. But everybody in Jesus came to die too. We came here to die so that we could be set free. So we could be in his bride. Remember the bride, she lived in the king's house. She was free. And she had an ability uh, because of the favor that the king had for her to save the Lord's people. And that could include your relatives, your children, your husband, so on and so forth. She had favor. He heard her voice. He heard her prayers. And so it is today. So, yes, it will be worth it to deny your old life, your thoughts, your ambitions, etc., it would be worth it to do this. It doesn't matter if you gain the whole world but forfeit your spiritual life. It's for nothing. Jesus tried to point that out to his disciples and to us. It's for nothing. It's all vain, a wind as Solomon would say, a breath. It's all going to pass away. But the eternal things are forever. They are forever. We're going to get different rewards while we're on this earth. The Lord likened it through Paul to star glory, moon glory, and sun glory. Those are differences of reward. The people who say there's no difference of reward, they haven't read the Bible. <clears throat> They're just passing on their religious garbage. There is differences of reward. A person in heaven who is sun glory lives a much higher life than a person who is star glory. A greater reward. A higher being. A closer to the presence of the Lord himself for eternity. Some will sit down in his throne, even as he overcame and sat down on his father's throne. Well, Father, we desire earnestly to be all we can be, <laughs> as they say, uh, be all that we can be. We, we desire it, Lord. We ask that you give us the grace in our hearts to desire to run after you like the Shulamite in Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Draw me, and we will run after thee. So, Lord, draw us. Draw us by your Spirit, and we will run after you. Lord, we desire that you work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. We desire to be well-pleasing unto you. That gift that you give in Romans, being well-pleasing unto you. We ask you, Lord, for that gift. We ask that constantly you work in us your will. Your will is in our heart, Lord, not our will. We ask, Lord, for this grace. We know that in the reconciliation, all that we were is dead and gone, and all that we are is Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we claim that gift. We know you recognize that as righteousness. You accept it as imputed righteousness from us when we believe these things. Lord, teach your people what to believe and what to not believe, what to cast down and what to believe. 
because what's in our mouth and coming out of uh, in our heart and coming out of our mouth is what our reward is going to be. We ask, Lord, for that gift, that gift of grace in our hearts to walk as he walked, to think as he thought. We have the mind of Christ. It is the word of God. We have the mind of Christ. And when we read it, Lord, help us to remember everything you want us to remember and what things we need to repent. That's the time to do it right there. Lord, I need more of that. Lord, I don't want this. Lord, uh, help people when they read the Word of God, Lord, to pray as they read the Word of God so they won't forget these things. I mean, it clearly points out what is the renewed mind of Christ. And Lord, help us to do this. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, saints, and keep us in your prayers, and we'll do the same for you. We we do this constantly, and um, exercise your authority against the principalities and powers and rulers of this darkness and their dominion out there, um, especially the deep state dominion. Uh, exercise your authority to cast that down. And uh, we will have a short time of rest in order for the church to get right with the Lord. I'm not saying rest as far as the judgments are upon the world. I'm talking about uh, rest from the beast. If you are sanctified, uh, saints, you're walking in sanctification. You have a right not to go under the dominion of the beast. And uh, so you can exercise your authority and your faith there. And pray for your families and, uh, and your loved ones who are not walking in that place but are going to receive a revival. There's a great revival coming after they get a demonstration of the anger of God against sin. Then there's going to come a revival. And Father, we thank you for that revival. We ask that it be tremendous. We ask that our loved ones and the people we prayed for be alive to partake of it. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father. Amen. All right. Good night, saints, and God bless you. For information, materials, and to contribute, go to unleavenedbreadministries.org. Contributions only may be addressed to David Eels. Post Office Box 231616, Montgomery, Alabama, 36123. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus, I trust in you. And when I face that darkest night, what will be my guiding light? The shining rays of red and white. Jesus, I trust in you. O oh, sacred heart, in you I find mercy seated for all time. I am yours and you are mine. Oh, Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus, I trust in you. Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word is true, oh Jesus.
Thank you.